welcome to the second part. I'm afraid this part will be a little bit more chemical, uh, but don't worry. Uh, just uh, keep on the bird eye of. of no feel necessary of so that the noon resulta uh no first keep it get us right so we don't want to for traffic in the pedal for no share me it see trying to see that first keep see drive muck me yeah uh learn this year man see see lo bad name to to a bad name Hello, what's up? Was rusty Fagerly, good news, lot people for so much in him. Fahib, so he flows net salad. No, in the poem, he poem, well, let me that I did. The office is just said, so he did most necessary good girl do better. Nah, so sort of the um, if one of the goals of synthetic biology was present, always present in this origins of life research, in the sense that then if you have these elementary components and then you articulate the components, the subsystems in a more complex system, this is of course synthetic biology. And 100 years ago there were people before the emergence of biochemistry, for example, as science, people trying to do that. Of course we can consider those uh, retrospectively, we can consider those attempts as a naive or very simple or, or wrong, but then the goal of those people was the same, trying to simulate in the laboratory the emergence of complex uh, uh, systems out of more simple uh, components. <coughs> Stefan Leduc, working in Nantes, very near, from here, uh, was uh, uh, publishing in 1912 this book that is, the title is La Biologie Synthétique. So even the term was used already 100 years ago. And I choose the, that, that, that sentence, like for me, is very, very, very uh, the definition of the, of the goal of those people like, like him. C'est en quoi est-il moins admissible de chercher à faire une cellule que de chercher à faire une molécule? That is, the same that organic chemists are doing with molecules, we can do it with cells. That is a logical extrapolation of our epistemological uh, program. So people, at least theoretically, were thinking about this systemic uh, constructions. I uh, put it one example, there are several, but just I chose this because Tibor Ganti, that was completely unknown before Ersat Mari was translating into English and publishing the works because he was publishing the work in Hungarian. So, unless you are 
able to read Hangar uh, is, is not possible to, to the access of these ideas. But he was proposing this idea of chemoton as the elementary uh, unit of life. And again, there are the three subsystems together, the metabolism, the boundary, and the template chemistry. And he was proposing a kind of gene analogy of these uh, subsystems until up to reach this, this, this level of complexity. So in my first talk, we were talking about a little bit some prebiotic uh, uh, sources for boundaries. Of course, the RNA world and all the prebiotic chemistry leading to monomers and, and polymers uh, to template chemistry. But I will devote this part of my talk, the second part, to the uh, metabolism, these autocatalytic uh, processes of generating small molecules, as we see in modern metabolism. There are many examples of autocatalytic uh, processes and catalytic cycles in, in metabolism. Those are some of them. Only for people that is familiar with metabolism, probably you never saw before glycolysis uh, represented as in this way. Our glycolysis is one of these almost universal process that is the mechanism that cells use for generating ATP, for example, or in metabolic intermediates from sugar, from glucose. And this is one example. One example is the lactic fermentation from glucose to lactate. You consume two ATPs, but at the end you have four ATPs. So you can see glycolysis, this metabolic process that always is written linearly, like a cycle, as an autocatalytic cycle of ATP production. So there are many others. This one is the autocatalytic synthesis of oxalate from acetate, and then many examples of simple catalytic, not at autocatalytic, but catalytic uh, processes. All those are extant uh, processes that you can recognize in, in modern cells. Of course, carbon fixation is also possible to be represented by catalytic cycles. Those are examples of uh, modern processes of uh, uh, carbon fixation. Usually in the textbook you learn about Calvin cycle, that is the one used by plants. But then there are other five processes uh, in addition to Calvin cycle that allows uh, the fixation of carbon. The only one that is not an auto a pure autocatalytic process is this one that is going from CO2 and mono carbon monoxide or uh, carbon dioxide to acetyl CoA to acetate through a series of catalytic processes uh, using metals. Uh, this is considered by several authors as the oldest way to fix carbon on Earth. I mean, it has a, a distribution both in bacteria and archaea, and for several reasons that are related to the use of uh, metal uh, transition metal uh, transition metals and other other properties uh, maybe this is considered the probably the the first uh, but then there are many others i mean well if you consider that uh, or you recognize the existence of catalytic and, and autocatalytic cycles in modern cells you the question is how those catalytic cycles started at the beginning in the abiotic earth. During many years, the only autocatalytic cycle that could be recognized in prebiotic conditions is the foremost reaction. Do you remember that we were talking about before about the polymerization of formaldehyde to generate different carbohydrates? This is an autocatalytic process. I think this is the only well-recognized autocatalytic abiotic process. Then authors were proposing several, several other processes like this one, polymerization of uh, hydrogen cyanide by Schwartz or this uh, sugar uh, world of uh, Art Weber or this, this is theoretical, the, theor the theoretical glyoxylate uh, cycle by Albert S. Moser that has some experimental support but this is not fully demonstrated. So the impression was that you have very few 
or only one true example of um, a, a biotic autocatalytic cycle that is very, I mean, is a very uh, a small sample of examples, only one to start with. So people were also looking at other autocatalytic and um, complex uh, behaviors like this one that was published two years ago. Uh, this is the autocatalytic generation of this molecule from one to two and with some interesting properties like uh, uh, periodic, uh, periodic oscillatory uh, processes. But then the repertoire of examples is, is short, is very short and this is very disappointing. So for many years we were looking at this gap between prebiotic chemistry and modern chemistry as a kind of cloud that it is impossible to fill this gap at least with the current knowledge. Before we were talking about the cyanosulfidic protometabolism could be one of the processes that are trying to go from this prebiotic uh, stages to more or less primitive uh, cells offering the, the explanation for the origin of several uh, important compounds. But then for many years people was just offering theories not uh, experiments. So one of the I, I would say more original and well elaborated theory was this one by Christian de Dieu that as I told before he was defending this idea of chemical determinism so he was offering us some details about what would be the chemistry filling the gap from prebiotic chemistry to biochemistry and he was looking at kind of molecules all, always universal in biochemistry that are thioesters. So the combination, this is the, the thioester uh, structure. So you can find many examples in modern metabolism of these uh, molecules. And he was proposing the relationship of this uh, kind of bond with many other processes related to modern metabolism, like the origin of ATP that we were talking before that how go from going from a more primitive uh, energy sources to a self-sustained uh, uh, source like it, ATP in, in metabolism. So he was proposing a scheme of going from, from prebiotic molecules to ATP and also to this kind of short peptides with uh, catalytic properties. So the, he was proposing that before the emergence of the true proteins, of the, or even before the emergence of ribozymes, there were other cat catalysts, of course minerals, but for him there were important multimers, that was the term that he was using for non-instructed peptides, non-genetically instructed peptides that were just generated by the system uh, at random. It is well known that collections of peptides uh, contain uh, uh, catalytic activities. So when you generate peptides by ran uh, at random, you, you, you have a good collection of some of them are, are catalyzing reactions. So, for example, to be more precise, this is a kind of redrawing of one of the figures of, of, of his book. He was proposing that from, sorry, from uh, cosmic chemistry and volcanic chemistry that were the abiotic uh, precursors. We're generating multimers from amino acids, the amphiphilic molecules for generating membranes and mineral catalysts to generate this term that is taken from German would mean heterogeneous mixtures of molecules, among them nucleotides and many other molecules participating as intermediates in the 
in the uh, metabolic pathways that would generate afterwards. So he was distinguishing this first part of the process that would be dominated by physics and chemistry, this kind of chemical determinism, uh, to generate all this heterogeneity. But after the appearance of RNA, and this particularly catalytic RNA that was performing the performance of reactions under natural selection. RNA can be replicated with mistakes, so natural selection can operate, and natural selection can optimize the activity. Minerals cannot reproduce and be optimized by natural selection. Uh, multimers, neither, because there is no genetic continuity. But then RNA, when you can transfer to the next generation properties that had been selected by natural selection, then there is another force, there is another situation completely different uh, that would be this uh, twice uh, actions on the system. The action of pure chemistry, of course, and the action of natural, natural selection. So, for this first part of chemically determined, we have the example of the cyanosulfidic metabolism, that I think is a very nice example of these uh, possible processes generating this dirty uh, metabolism initially. Uh, John Sutherland has been trying to, in a recent paper, trying to compare the general pattern of the cyanosulfidic proto-metabolism with the modern metabolism. So there are some uh, properties, some patterns that can be analogous. So this is very suggestive. I mean, the general configuration of the cyanosulfidic proto-metabolism can be the may show parallels with modern metabolism. But then I think it is very interesting in this context to refer to this work. This is again a work by Matt Pauner uh, at UCL that recently was describing the origin of the SOM glycolytic intermediates from the cyanosulfidic uh, metabolism. So, the cyanosulfidic protometabolism is generating also ma the main intermediates in the second part of glycolysis that is considered by most biochemists as the oldest part of this pathway. So, it could be the case that glycolysis started as a kind of transformations between molecules of three and of three and two carbons to generate diversity of skeletons that then will serve as a precursor of other, of other molecules. Here in blue is the enzymatic or modern glycolysis, and in this part I represented the uh, main reactions that Pauner and co-workers have proposed as the primitive skeleton or primitive pattern of this uh, metabolic, uh, important metabolic uh, pathway. So this is a very nice indication that from the protometabolisms you have the ingredients of modern metabolisms. So the, the big difference is here is completely uh, abiotic without enzymes and those are the transformation enzyme catalyzed. So the emergence of, cat of biological catalysts being ribozymes or afterwards proteins would be the way to co-opt those molecules that were present in the, the uh, proto-metabolism and then incorporated in the uh, extant pathways. The existence of several intermediates in a prebiotic setting, there are other lines of research that are indicating that is plausible. For example, I will refer to these two works that I think that are very suggestive. One is from uh, Marcus Ralser in, in Cambridge and London, uh, 
that was demonstrating very recently that in some under some chemical conditions you can recover most if not all the transformation between the uh, intermediates of the Krebs cycle and also this uh, group from Strasbourg uh, Joseph Moran and co-workers had been publishing very recently the inorganic catalysis by metals of the main transformation of the uh, uh, reverse Krebs cycle. So here we have transformation referring to the Krebs cycle that we see how operating in many many cells today that is an, an oxidative pathway that oxidation of acetate and then the, the Moran's uh, processes is the reverse the reductive pathway that is also observed in, in, modern, in some modern cells as a carbon fixation pathway. So the idea is very well connected with Morovich and the Dupe uh, original ideas. There were the main intermediates, in this case the intermediates of the cycle present, and then the emergence of good catalyzers of one process or the other would fix the, Im the image of the modern pathways. So you have a kind of fuzzy chemistry that was focused by uh, specialized um, uh, catalyzers. So up to now we have several examples as a summary that indicate that the intermediates were present in this proto-metabolism. So the, the, the molecules that we see as metabolic intermediates were present in a mixture, in this gamish, in this dirty mix, mixture that was proposed by the Duke. More recently, uh, Ran Krishnamurti in Scripps has proposed this very nice scheme of reactions that all together, there are two cycles here with one intermediate in common, this oxaloacetate that is participating in a Krebs cycle. The left cycle is the hydroxyketoglutarate cycle that is, able, is glyoxylate is entering the cycle here. And then you have two CO2 emerging the cycle. This cycle is operating as uh, oxidation of these two carbon Molecules. This is very quite similar to the Krebs cycle that the acetate is entering the cycle and then two CO2 is emerging from the cycle. And then the same in this uh, other cycle that is the malonate cycle. So it's operating from here, from malonate, gly glyoxylate is entering the cycle and then two CO2 is emerging, the same. The two cycles are oxidizing glyoxylate is not the same as Krebs cycle, but from a chemical point of view, there is a very nice parallelism. This is the Krebs cycle. Acetate, acetyl CoA is entering with oxaloacetate to generate citrate. Sometimes it's called the citrate cycle, citric acid cycle also. Or tricarboxylic, yeah? three, three acid uh, functions. So the citrate is transformed uh, to a molecule that is spontaneously decarboxylates. So here we have two carbons, four carbons, six carbons, then five carbons, another decarboxylation, and then regeneration of the original molecule. So this is a catalytic cycle. Oxalacetate is catalyzing the process. Okay? So in, uh, we have to, to learn that in addition to enzymes, either ribozymes or proteins, in the cells are small molecules acting as catalyzers. That is, oxalacetate is the cat catalyst in addition to every enzyme participating in the cycle. Oxalacetate is, and this is one of the problems we have to explain, the origin of those small molecules as catalysts of catalyst of those processes. And look at this, Th the kind of reaction, no problem with the terms, but this is an addition of two carbons over four, number one. This is a decarboxylation, first decarboxylation, and second decarboxylation. 
uh, a special kind of the carboxylation, beta keto acid or alpha keto acid. This is the process in the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is a first for students is a little bit complicated to learn, but instead of learning by heart the Krebs cycle, please understand the chemical logic behind that is, and the, you use molecules of two carbons to generate two CO2. And then the exergonic processes are coupled to the synthesis of uh, ATP or electrons that for the um, respiratory chain or whatever. But essentially you have number one, number two, number three, this in this order. So this is the same that Ram Krishnamurti has found in this abiotic bicycle. One, two, three, one, two, three. In this and in this. And this is a very nice observation. That is, I think it's the first time that somebody has described a completely abiotic process of catalytic cycles with a amazing parallelism with metabolic pathways. There are more things to, to point. This, this, this reaction is very important because by, by natural decay, oxalacetate spontaneously is transformed in pyruvate by the carboxylation, spontaneous decarboxylation. So also they describe this reaction in terms of bio, for those knowing biochemistry, this term is, uh, this reaction is called anaplerotic. These are the reactions that are uh, rebuilding uh, the intermediates in the catalytic cycle. So we can rebuild and regenerate the intermediates in the, in the catalytic cycle by this kind of reaction. But also another parallelism with the natural uh, pathways is that pathways Krebs cycle, for example, you always think about the generation of electrons for respiration or generation of ATP. But then, very important, the generation of intermediates that serve as precursors of other things. For example, malonate as a, and glyoxylate as a precursor of aspartate. I mean, there are a series of reactions that diverge from the cycle, take intermediates from the cycle to build new things. All the amino acids we, we are able to, to synthesize, when, when I said we, I am not referring to humans, but we are uh, uh, quite limited in this, in this. we as, as living beings in general, we build all the amino acids from common intermediates, from glycolytic and TCA intermediates, and then nucleotides, particularly nucleobases, from amino acids. So the first, we have the central pathways, then you irradiate to amino acids and from amino acids to nucleobases. This is the general arrangement of uh, modern metabolism. So here is one example of this. You go from an intermediate to an amino acid like in modern metabolism. So we can probably, at this moment, we are living a very, very interesting, in my opinion, very interesting moment in, in the research on the origins of life. We, are we have several examples of processes, and we need more, of course, that are filling this cloud. Sutherland's and Pounder's cyanosulfidic world, Krishnamurti's bicycle is a very nice, uh, a unique example of, the, of, this, of these processes. And also the Ralses and Moran's observations are very interesting in the sense that they are offering explanations for the presence of metabolic intermediates in under abi abiotic conditions. Okay. So we were going from this part to up to uh, biology, from chemistry to biology. I will offer some examples of uh, going 
a little bit from biology to chemistry, or at least to Luca. But then one thing that I was uh, saying before, the general mistake of taking Luca as the origin of life. So the using phenotypic characteristic of, of Luca, metabolic or other characteristics of, of Luca, and extrapolating this to the origins of life. So Luca is here and the origins of life is here. We don't have any idea of this in, te in temporal or scale of time. We don't know how many millions of years would, would take from here to here, but we, it is easy to understand that in terms of complexity, there is a long distance from here to here because we can deduce that Luca was already uh, cell, were cells with DNA as genome, ribosome uh, working uh, as today with the genetic, universal genetic code uh, in place, etc. Et so, this is very recent. This is 2 3 February. So, this is one month ago. Science, the same issue of science. This paper and this paper together, two groups from Japan, from the, the States, a pre primordial and reversible TCI cycle in a facultatively chemolithoautotrophic thermophile, and this reversibility of citrate synthase allows autotrophic growth of a thermophilic bacterium. Well, this is a very nice discovery of bacteria using the TCA cycle, the oxidative one, in reverse. Something that, again, if you ask in, in an exam, you ask to students uh, until one month ago, you must answer always the, the direction of TCA is by thermodynamics is always the same, oxidative. Never will occur the reverse until now. So life is full of surprises and metabolism is full of surprises. So now we have to think about the TCI cycle with, uh, with the twice possible directions. The conventional one, the one Krebs described uh, many years ago in an oxidative way and the reverse the reverse, using the same enzyme, the citrate synthase, that textbooks point out as the one of the endergonic processes that cannot be reversed. Well, it can be reversed if conditions allow the reversion of this. That is mass action law. I mean, it's the, the flow, the flux of met metabolites that is that are determining the direction. And those bacteria are able to use the same enzymes in an oxidative way to take or to obtain energy from acetate or in a reductive way to fix carbon. So they are able to use heterotrophic mode sometimes or autotrophic mode sometimes with the same pathway that is the first time that can be uh, said that thing. So look at this. Well, this is a comment that uh, this Ratzdale was uh, writing these news and views. That is at least this part is is, is interesting to to understand the the meaning of of the discovery. But then look at now is a sociological exercise. Look at the conclusions of the two papers. The Japanese paper, the primordial and etc., is saying the reverse TCI cycle is believed to be one of the most ancient carbon fixation pathways on Earth. Well, more or less. And then there is a long history of debate over heterotrophic versus autotrophic origin of life scenarios. True. And now they were presenting biochemical evidences of the TCI cycle in reverse now and say a facultative chemolito mixotrophic that it means 
atotrophic and heterotrophic at the same time. Origin of life, more likely scenarios for the origin of life on Earth. Why? Why you are extrapolating from true biology, even from Luca, if you want, to the origin of life? There is no reason to do that. But for referees and editors of science, it don't, don't, don't care. The other paper, and this in the, in the abstract is also raises the possibility of a qualitatively chemolithothermotrophic origin of life. This is the last sentence in the abstract. The other paper I think is more interesting from a sociological point of view because raises a big and enormous problem. We are deducing properties of cells from genomes. Until now, if you have the repertoire of TCI enzymes, you can say this bacteria or these microorganisms or these organisms perform the TCI cycle. But then with the same enzymes, you have the reverse process. You never will deduce the real metabolic processes without the biochemical evidence. So this raises a problem that was more or less implicit in the, de in the, the development of systems biology and genomics. You, you, then in the on universal tree of life, you have many rot, red uh, um, spots of bacteria or archaea that you only have the genome, nothing else. You don't have a representative of those cells. Now, for example, we have a complete theory of the origins of eukaryotes from archaea, from a group of archaea, the Asgard archaea, and the only evidence we have some are <coughs> genomes. We even we don't have a picture of Asgard archaea, only genomes from metagenomic analysis. So those people say <coughs> the reverse oxidative TCI cycle can hardly be recognized bioinformatically. It makes metagenome based bioinformatic predictions of the autotrophic potential of an aerobic organism or microbial community difficult if not impossible. So many studies today are based on bioinformatic analysis without biochemical Evidences. So we need more microbiologists, we need more biochemists, we, we need more protein chemists to demonstrate that metabolic functions are real more than the presence of a bunch of sequences. So this is very important because in my country at least, um, education is focused in bioinformatics, not bioinformatics, but genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and other omics, but less in biochemical, classical metabolic studies. That we need that if we want to know in deep uh, the, the qualities and the properties of uh, bi the biosphere. So, well, the only evolutionary sentence in all the paper is this one. The reverse oxidative TCI cycle may even predate the modern reverse TCI cycle with an ancestral TCI cycle being full, fully reversible. Nothing about origins of life, only evolution of pathways. So maybe the oxidative was predating the reverse or reductive uh, cycle. Well, unexpected discoveries, which other apparently unidirectional metabolic reaction may be reversed under certain conditions. So we are basing on classical thermodynamics, but the real metabolic flux would uh, answer this question. Require classical biochemical studies for the discovery. So again, this is a, a claim in favor or more biochemists, microbiologists working on real metabolic. Well, sometimes sequences are very useful. For example, here we have demonstrated that the key enzymes for the reverse TCI cycle 
that is ATPC trade lyase and these other two this is a combination of these two and by phylogenetic analysis those two are derived from enzymes of the oxidative Krebs cycle so phylogeny is also helping to orient our perspective that the oxidative cycle was before than the reduct reductive cycle so we are still on time right yes well my last part of the talk will be related with things that we can deduce from comparative biochemistry so this mm, process or approach from biology to uh, chemistry stopping in Luca or a little bit more because we cannot extrapolate if you are doing phylogenies for example like this uh, th that example that was using before those are phylogenies of uh, protein sequences so we cannot extrapolate those uh, phylogenies beyond the the invention of or the, the appearance of the genetic code not even the origins of life so we are comparing proteins so we are comparing molecules that are telling stories since the appearance of the ribosome and the genetic code not before but then we can learn a little bit about uh, how metabolic pathways or at least the biological uh, enzymes appear there are several models in history we can look at the different ideas and models that have been proposed for example the origin of pathways backwards in the sense that we already uh, uh, we see the, the the performance today forwards a kind of semi-enzymatic origin some enzymes and some <coughs> non-enzymatic processes together and this patchwork as assembly that is uh, a very nice model that well if you look at the distribution of uh, for example st structural motifs in enzymes in modern metabolism it looks like this uh, patchwork assembly that is represented very nicely very simply in, in this term in this uh, scheme Re if this is uh, time older and younger, older red and younger blue, then in retroevolution, the first one would be the last enzyme operating in the pathway would be the older and then backwards to the, the younger. The forward will be the reverse, the pathway will start with this uh, enzyme and then incorporating the enzyme. And the patchwork, there is a mixture because the incorporation could be uh, at random. Uh, co-opting enzymes of different origins uh, and different ages. The authors that were proposing those models had their own examples. I mean, this is not out of the blue. I mean, they had uh, arguments and examples to uh, give support to, this, uh, to these schemes. But after the possibility to of, of analysis of the structure of many enzymes, many sequences, Today, this is the, probably the, <coughs> the idea that it, the metabolism is a mixture of enzymes of different ages. And for example, this uh, typical structure, the team barrel, that is one of the domains, the structural domains that is used in different enzymes in metabolism. We have here a uh, scheme of the metabolism, the TCA cycle the glycolysis, uh, the synthesis of amino acids, nucleotides, and then those pieces are the enzymes that are participating in different uh, pathways with this common uh, domain. Of course, it's hardly to, I mean, if you propose that those are independent origins of this solution it is very hard to believe because the probability <laughs> to emerge the same 3d structure independently in evolution is very low uh, the most par parsimonious uh, solution would be saying all those enzymes that share this 
domain have a common origin and then diversified in different substrate specificity, participating with different substrates here and there, or even different uh, reaction, pro uh, reaction mechanism by gene duplication and diversification. That is a genetic mechanism that is well known uh, in evolution. So, in general terms, we can imagine that uh, originally there were few enzymes, there were multifunctional in the sense that there were not very good recognizing, recognizing subs substrates. So that means that a few enzymes, represented here by the black dot, are using several molecules to transform in several products. So we have a diversity of transformation with a few enzymes with low specificity. But now we learn in biochemistry and enzymology that most enzymes are very specific. At least the enzymes in the core or the central pathway. So most of enzymes here are participating with only one substrate given only one product. Then a few enzymes show a more relaxed relation with substrates and share substrates and even so a uh, nice interesting uh, property that is promiscuity that I will define immediately. And then of course we have some uh, molecules that are shared by different enzymes. You have many examples for example ATP, NAD, the cofactors or even some intermediates like oxalacetate or glutamate are shared by many enzymes. So there are some um, substrates that are um, highly connected in the, in the network of, of the metabolism. So to understand the origin of this diversity of, of specificities and activities, we have to look at the enzyme as a flexible structure, not as a rigid. It's, it is true that it's, it's very nice that uh, many years ago when Fisher at the beginning of 20th century was looking at the stereo specificity of enzymes, he was looking or thinking about the relationship between lock and key. That is a very nice metaphor. And then only one key is able to open uh, uh, one specific lock. So these were uh, think, uh, the thinking of proteins or enzymes are rigid structures recognizing by complementary <laughs> the specific substrate. That was a very nice observation, the extraordinary specificity of enzymes. Then many cases were not fitting this very rigid uh, idea and other people were trying to introduce this transformation of the mole, the induced fit, Cosland and others, they were saying, well, is not exactly complementary with the substrate, but the substrate induced the change of the structure to perfect complementary. So there is some margin for, for flexibility in this case. Nowadays, the model that we use today is that proteins are in a, an equilibrium of different conformations. The same protein can be found in different structural uh, dispositions in the space, like so this, this scheme. Uh, this is the main or the more abundant or the native uh, structure. The arrows are just the equilibrium that is going to this uh, major form. But there are mi minor structures that are not playing uh, functional uh, performance in the sense that the function, the metabolic function is this one, but then the coexistence of other, because of the flexibility of proteins. Proteins are not, are not solid, not rigid. Then the, if the gene of this coding this protein is duplicated, that is a mechanism, very well known mechanism of uh, evolution in microorganisms, and you have the original copy, 
coding for this protein and then an additional copy and the possibility to evolve in parallel. So the accumulation of mutations could be you can preserve a copy for the native structural uh, enzyme but then the second one can be different and modify the equilibrium to another different structure. So those proteins would be homologous, have a common ancestor, but they are performing different functions. So we <coughs> imagine that the diversification of the specificity of uh, substrate recognition or even the mechanism of uh, the catalytic reaction is uh, evolving by duplication and uh, diversification. There are many evidences. I mean, this is not theory. I mean, there are many experimental evidences, including evolution in the laboratory, experimental evolution, that you have this coexistence of native, uh, native uh, structure of recognition of a substrate and the coexistence of other structures that can recognize maybe another substance, another molecule. This is the idea of promiscuity. Here it's important to, to remark that this is the function that is under selection. And this one is, a, is not a function for evolution. It's just a secondary effect of the structural flexibility of the enzyme. But in occasions, this could be under selection. For example, when you take a microorganism and in a changing environment, there are many different carbon sources. How do you adapt to the different carbon sources? Or imagine the people that were working in this, uh, particular Dan Tofik in Israel, they were focusing on the emergence of new catalytic activities that they're able to uh, transform artificial molecules that were not in, the, in nature 50 years ago or, or one century ago. For example, a pesticide. So molecules generated by the industry and you find microorganisms that learn how to cope with those molecules and live out of those molecules. They are eating those molecules. And that means, in terms of evolution, a short period of time. But then, against the Darwinian prejudice, evolution is very rapid. It's very fast finding solutions. So under the appropriated selection pressure, those microorganisms learn how to uh, metabolize those molecules. So they were interested in how promiscuous activities become native. And they, well, classically we, we believe that the, 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 in the ancient uh, primitive states, enzymes were generalist with the several capacity to recognize several molecules, A, B, C, D. And then by divergence, several enzymes, a specialist, one recognizing A, B, C, D, E, F, but then look at the other letters with a modest capacity still to, or a kind of memory, recognizing other molecules. So the situation today would be this mixture of enzymes that are specialists but still performing modestly uh, the other functions. That means the possibility to emerge again uh, the ancient function. So this is the, the experimentally tested uh, pathway from here to here. I mean from a specialist to generalist and then to generalist to a new specialist. And this is in experimental evolution, the observed pathway. You have a, today an enzyme that is good for doing performing one function. And then under pressure, you can move in this space for new function. Look at this part. In this position, you still 
are good performing the original function and you are performing not so bad the new function. But then this is a multi uh, op optimal situation. You cannot very, be very good in everything. So if you press to be a specialist in the second function, you are losing the first one. So we need maybe a specialist in different functions, but also we have the possibility to have some generalist. And depending on the position in the metabolism, depending on the function, maybe you are required to be a very good specialist, or maybe it's good to, per, to, to, to become a generalist enzyme. And this is the situation. Well, this is Kim is repeating uh, a little bit the, the, the process of gene duplication and uh, focusing the image of the specificity from one generalist to three specialists. And it can be performed the, the other way around. For example, in, in, uh, in symbionts where the genome is reduced, we are losing uh, functions and then recovering the generalist character of the probably primitive state. But then if you, if you look at the distribution of specialists and generalists in metabolisms, you have a nice distribution of many canonical specialist enzymes, all, all of those in blue, and then a fraction of enzymes that are generalists. So in the modern metabolisms, there, there is a coexistence of specialist and generalist enzymes. It is true that when you study biochemistry, you only heard about the specialists. Well, too bad. But why? Maybe because the ancient <coughs> pathways and the central pathways that you learn as chapter one, glycolysis, chapter two, Krebs cycle, chapter three, beta oxidation, the chapters of the book are built on the ancient pathways that are populated by specialist enzymes. But then there are many others in this part of the chart. I cannot read this, but anyway, those are different pathways. There are many others that are populated by generalists. I will put two examples, two extreme examples. When you need a very, very, very good specialist, this part. The number one in a specialist is amino acid tRNA synthase, the tRNA charging. You don't want that, that those enzymes are making mistakes, recognizing the cognate tRNA and the amino acid. You need as much specificity as possible. Even in that case, you need some mechanism to correct mistakes because specificity has a limit also, a physical limit. In the other, in the other extreme, for example, uh, there are the enzymes that perform the synthesis of phospholipids for membranes. You don't need an enzyme because phospholipids are families of heterogeneous molecules. You don't need an, one enzyme that links uh, glycerol phosphate with fatty acid of 16 carbons, fatty acid with 14, and another one for the reverse, and another one for uh, 18 carbons or unsaturated. No, with one enzyme, you synthesize everything because you are generalist. You don't care about the length of the fatty acid. You only care about the stereochemical uh, position of the glycerol phosphate and nothing else. Then two fatty acids come together. Uh, and no problem with the length or the saturation of the chain. So those are very generalist. So depending on the process, you need going to one extreme to, a, to the other extreme. And with catalysis, it's the same. Here is the distribution of catalytic properties of enzymes of all the enzymes had, that had been described uh, until now or until the date of the publication, 2011. They took all the enzymes in the database that had been measured, kinetically measured uh, and published, and then with all the catalytic uh, 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 properties, they represent the distribution. So there is classically also the idea that 
as fast the enzymes go as fast as possible? Well, not necessarily. In some cases you need very fast reaction, in some cases it doesn't matter. So the distribution of the catalytic constant or the uh, Michelis constant, that is a measure, a proxy, uh, a proxy of uh, affinity, and the two things together shows that the maximum possible uh, catalytic performance of enzymes is in this extreme. You have some examples that appear in the, in the textbook like uh, triose phosphate isomerase or superoxid uh, the dismutase or fumarase or uh, carbonic anhydrase as very good performers. But most enzymes are here for uh, orders of magnitude lower. So in general you don't need the the best performance possible, the perfect enzyme that was called in the 70s. And even Rubisco, that is the enzyme catalyzing the fixation of carbon in the Calvin cycle, that is famously because, well, poor enzyme is very slow, uh, with many defects. Well, it's a normal one. Rubisco is performing very well in comparison to the rest of enzymes in the metabolism. Again, the distribution of this catalytic, the same as the specificity, the distribution of the catalytic properties of the enzymes is not homogeneous. If you analyze enzymes in the core of metabolism or in the peripheric part of the metabolism, the so-called secondary metabolism, the distribution of performance is, is uneven. So you have good performers in terms of specificity and catalytic properties in the ancient and central pathways and more flexible, more not so specific, not so fast enzymes in the peripheric part of metabolism. Because I, I talk about periphery because metabolism is like an onion. You have this metabolic core, basically this uh, carbon and hydrogen oxygen molecules transformed by glycolysis and Krebs cycle. And then you have uh, li layers of, 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 of metabolic pathways uh, performing uh, lipid metabolism and then nitrogen metabolism like amino acids and then uh, nucleotide metabolism. And more in the surface of this uh, onion, the, uh, the so-called secondary metabolism that is very specific, not general, not universal. For example, all the processes of detoxification, it makes sense. In the surface of the metabolism, you have the connection with the environment. You have to cope with molecules, some of them very new for you uh, in, the, in the environment. So those enzymes are very generalist that transforming this detoxification would mean transforming these molecules in central uh, components. That can be observed also in the general topology of metabolism. This is our studies of the structural, the, 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 the structure, topological structure of, of, the, of the networks that the modules are organized in this, in this way. And we were looking at the, the signal of natural selection. This, I, I'm not going to, into details, but you can measure the presence of natural selection in, uh, on, uh, in genes and the distribution of the signal of natural selection in different layers of the metabolism. And in this study we, we observed that in the metabolic core and in the successive uh, layers, natural selection is more relaxed uh, uh, in external layers than in the inner core. So the inner core are under pressure uh, the specificity, the catalytic properties, in comparison to the external, uh, more flexible uh, layers. <coughs> so basically, in general, we have this uh, idea that, evolu that evolution is performing mm, and inno innovates, not from scratch, but using all their parts uh, or their other parts that well before were performing other functions. So you use all parts to perform new functions. This idea was proposed by Darwin also. 
so I will finish the, this part with uh, with the the idea of Darwin of using uh, all the uh, mechanisms and devices to generate novelty. This is not this fragment is not from the origins of a species. 1862 is from the monograph of the orchids at the end of the monograph when he was studying how the flowers are co-evolving with insects and all the devices of the flowers are co-adapted to the poll pollinators to perform this efficiently, this process efficiently. Uh, he was observing this, that <coughs> evolution is using all, all tricks, all devices to perform new functions. At the molecular level, François Jacob, the colleague of uh, Jacques Monod, and here we complete the, the couple, François Jacob was taking the idea and going to the molecular level and saying, well, if you see, for example, uh, in the evolution of eyes, during the evolution of animals, the origin of the proteins of the crystalline, of the lens, is not from scratch, it's not an invention from scratch, it's the re reuse of ancient proteins with another function. In fact, if you analyze the proteins present in the lens of different eyes, from birds, reptiles, mammals, then you discover that sometimes are recycled enzymes. The same enzyme, for example, an enzyme participating in the urea cycle, is also used as a protein in the lens. So evolution discovered that those proteins were good to regulate the uh, refraction index, in addition to the uh, enzymatic performance. So this would be a nice example of promiscuous activity co-opted by evolution to perform a different thing. So, instead of an engineer, we, lo we look at evolution as a bricoleur, uh, one that is using things, all things, to build new devices. Thank you.